from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. And a very good day to everyone, and welcome back to The Sculptor's Funeral. I am your host, Jason Arkles, a sculptor and teacher living and working in Florence where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. And today we're going to hear a conversation that I had with British sculptor Mark Jackson. You may remember Jackson, known to his friends as Jacko, as the collaborator with sculptor Charlie Langton on the Pegasus and Bellerophon statue they created as part of the memorial to the Parachute Regiment and Airborne Forces in the United Kingdom. I interviewed Charlie and Jacko near their studios in Wiltshire in April 2015. But then the next day, I caught up with Mark Jackson for a conversation to hear more about his career and his work. We met at the painting studio of a mutual friend, James Hayes. James's studio is a bit of a figurative painter's dream. It was purpose-built as a painter's studio in Earl's Court in London in the 19th century, and the lighting is perfect, and it's filled with James's work. He's a portrait painter. But on that day, James Hayes was acting in the capacity not of artist, but as artist's model. Jacko had come to model James's portrait in clay. Okay, and that chin down, please. Chin down. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Instead of sitting down with Mark Jackson to have the interview, he preferred to sculpt and be interviewed at the same time, which should come as no surprise to anyone who knows Jacko. Taking on as much as he can is his standard procedure and he somehow manages never to take on too much or give a half-hearted effort to anything. Mark Jackson is the sort of artist I admire the most, one whose work is in alignment with his personality and life experiences. Much like his friend Charlie Langton, whose lifelong passion for thoroughbred horses has found an outlet in his work, Mark Jackson has a history. Calling it a previous life isn't too much of a stretch. And his experiences have given him unusual depth of insight into various facets of society, gaining intimate knowledge of groups and subcultures in our society, which many of us can only view from the outside. And this intimacy influences the work that Jacko does and how he does it. Mark Jackson started out in the military. He was commissioned into the Parachute Regiment in 1995 and served in several tours and missions around the world. He would eventually move up the ranks to become acting major of the 3rd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment, or 3rd Para, as it's commonly called. But back in 2000, Jacko's foreordained career in the military took an unexpected turn. So, yeah, but then, uh, then because you were, you, were a, you were a para, right? Yes. You did jumps. How many jumps? Uh, uh, not that many, actually. Oh, um, no. uh, that's 150. No Not that many, huh? Okay. Yeah. I know, but I mean, you know, as a, you know, right, people, right. people who, who jump regularly, you know, and who are experienced, uh, free from parachutists, you know, they have jump numbers in the, in the thousands. Right, right. But uh, then you went on vacation. Yeah, busman's holiday, and um, just uh, was in a bit of a tight spot coming down, and made what turned out to be a wrong call too close to the ground. So, um, yeah, I just, just hit the ground a bit too hard. Uh, I said, you know, damaged myself enough that it took me nearly a year to get back to work, but I was incredibly lucky. My head and my spine were intact. Um, and what I did actually does usually um, end in a memorial service. So I was lucky in many ways. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. Now, you, you, you left the Army as a major uh, after... Uh, well, a few years after you had you had a very uh, a bad parachute jump, didn't end well. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you stayed in the army for another two years after that. I actually didn't know that until very recently. I didn't realize. Yeah, well, that. I mean, it took me um, uh, just shy of a year to get, actually get back to duty, um, which is a process of operations and rehabilitation, and um, and then subsequent to that, I then stayed in for two years when I'd already made the decision to leave the army and pursue art, but it was a practical matter of needing to funding the study. So, you know, I can't claim ultimate foresight all the way through, but it sort of felt right at the time. And with hindsight, it was a good thing 
to do because I could have a gentle transition out of a military mindset and just start getting my head into, you know, you literally, it's the other side of the brain, isn't it, in, in many ways. Um, well, there's, there's more overlap than, than, than um, the stereotypes of either would, would suggest. But, uh, um, yeah, having that transitional time um, was, uh, was fantastic because I was uh, you know, ge genuinely very passionate about the public service and, and the good that we did. Um, and the best bits, in many ways, aren't in the cultural um, conscious in the ways that the question or the, you know, the, the or debatable um, uses of the British armed services in you know, the last 15, 20 years. Um, so, for example, if I said I'm maybe, you know, it could be said I'm, I'm proudest of our involvement in Macedonia, you probably don't even know what NATO did in Macedonia, especially British army. And we essentially stopped the civil war before it started. Now, even our own public don't really aren't really aware of that. There was oh. nothing worth reporting. Nothing happened. Is there a better use of 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 a, of a you know a standing army in Europe than to stop a you know a civil war in the Balkans before it starts? Right. Especially with the precedence of the sort of genocide that gone on in neighbouring countries previous to that. Um, so those sort of involvements that we as people who took part in them carry with us. Um, but if you know if we if we talk if you know people who are aware of our service conversation will obviously, more interestingly, come around to deployments uh, like the Middle East and Af Afghanistan. Sure. Uh, where the long-term effects of those are still to be seen. But, um, you know, um, as a serving soldier, you actually get involved in a lot which is just um, good, positive, does, if not change the world for the better. In the instance of Macedonia, it's a great example of just making sure it doesn't change for the worse. Yeah. After Mark Jackson left active service, after his recovery from the accident which almost took his life, he studied for several years at the Charles H. Cecil Studio in Florence and returned to England to begin his career as a sculptor. It's probably not surprising that Jacko's first commissions were of military subjects or commissions for the military itself. I asked Jacko if he intended to specialize in this sort of work, if he considered himself a military sculptor. I suppose. Yeah. I hate being kind of. I will hate being defined too much by anything. But yeah. really, do you feel like you're pigeonholed a bit as a like a military? Uh, I, th I always think there's a danger of that, and I that's when like military commissions come around. I'm always a little bit. My first instinct is uh, both on a slightly personal level and also well, because there's not much freedom for kind of uh, interpretation if it's military commission, basically in that. So. Again, it's a matter of you know, perspective and motivation. So, me as a sculptor, I'm sculpting something, I can be concentrating just on the sadness of a group of young people who have lost their lives for the service of their country, often um, because of politics. You know, it's not for them the politics. They, they are they are the, the firemen and they get sent to put out fires. You know, that's what defence should be about. But the political ramifications of the decisions to deploy, you know, any potentially lethal force anywhere around the world can often be called into question. Now, so when you, if you represent if you represent a campaign physically, it includes both. Well, you don't, you know, what I would like to um, remember or be remembered for in terms of my involvement is a sort of the, 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 the political um, vagaries around any, any campaign um, you know, projection of foreign policy, basically. Right, right, and uh, of course, in my mind, I'm focusing on the sadness that um, you know, people have lost their lives in service of the country, and that's what they are doing. And, um, therefore, a physical manifestation of essentially what can be um, often, you know, uh, conflict involving fatalities, uh, which is never to be glorified. And it's you know, it's, it's the same, it's the same like war films. They say um, every war film is an anti-war film. Even if it's done with sort of propaganda and glorification, actually, then you read irony into that. So you know, any any war memorial is an anti-war memorial. You know, it's not glorifying conflict. But that's probably not the point of view that the people who are actually commissioning the work feel about sure, your work. Sure, sure. But if you, so have, you know, if you have a if you have a physical manifestation, a reminder of 
yeah, like you mentioned, we're all in London. We have many of them, as do many capital cities around the world. Um, a, it's, it's, it's a shrine for the family and friends of those who, who've lost their lives, and it's always poignant. Um, and it is, for those individuals who've lost their lives, it is a noble sacrifice. The reasons why they were there and died may not be noble or might be up for debate, but for them, it was noble. Um, and so it is a shrine and a, a memorial, mainly for friends and family. But actually also, rather than glorifying any involvement in any campaign, if that can be a physical reminder, and it's a thing that the politicians and the decision makers and the leaders will be walking past and driving past regularly, it'll be part of the fabric of their life. You know, it is a reminder that people, people die when they send armies to get involved in conflicts. You know, and actually, that is a very useful thing. Wow, are you conscious of that when you uh, when yeah, you design? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, like absolutely. I mean, I mean, obviously the, the 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 sacrifice and the loss and the significance of the work for the families. But is there something that you can add to a work that you do specifically geared towards reminding the the powers that? No, not in a signposted way. You have to be very careful. So obviously, you, you know, if you're using a, your commission to create a memorial, I think it it would be churlish and inappropriate to use that to make any kind of political statement. Sure, not a political statement, but as you say, a, a reminder. Is there something that uh, well, and, uh, only just, that? Just as I said, you know, the, the people who who I say make the decisions that lead to, to war memorials having to be created in the first place uh, are not stupid people. It doesn't need signposting. You know, you can't look at a war memorial without thinking about dead soldiers. You just can't. Um, and you know, they do. Fa they feel the gravity of their decisions intensely. Of course, they do. Um, and, you know, like it or not, debated or not, we're still in a world at the moment where sometimes uh, lethal force or, the, or the, just the threat of lethal force is, it is a valid tool in, in diplomacy, in our, in our relations around the world. It's very difficult to, to um, um, unquestionably uh, connect some of our engagements overseas with essentially the, the defence of our way of life on our own soil. But there is a connection. It's murky and it's, it's very hard to actually completely pin that down. Anyway, so it's fairly tangential to, to actually producing a sculpture for, for any particular campaign. When you did the Irish Guardsman Memorial in, in, uh, in uh, Windsor, obviously there are a lot of people who are currently serving uh, and this probably, I imagine, would have been sort of the, the first sort of close encounter with an artist uh, and with serious consideration of uh, a sculpture. And it's not just, you know, a fact of being military, it's just modern life. A lot sure. of people don't have contact with painters and sculptors and, and people who, who build monuments. Uh, what's the reaction that you get from servicemen? I know you, uh, you actually sculpted the, the work in the barracks, is that correct? What was I did, yeah. Like? I mean... Um... In the first instance, I was driven by the fact that I didn't actually have a studio space myself large enough to do a overlight size standing figure in. It, uh, it did add value to the whole experience, certainly for myself, and I hope also for, um, uh, for the commissioners and those that they commissioned the piece on behalf of, because it became sort of quite a holistic experience. You know, I was um, uh, engaging with, uh, you know, with them, you know, from commanding officer to newest private soldier on a daily basis, um, and that informs you know, every every regiment um, has a different culture. That you know the British Army is often best described as a, as a collection of tribes who worked for a common purpose, but they all have their own culture. Um, so and much of that was sort of new to me. Um, so that was fan that was fantastic to uh, to actually be there. It was an interesting, the most interesting psychological aspect of that commission was the fact that when they first got in touch and we started talking about the commission, they were actually uh, halfway through a tour in Afghanistan at the time, and it was a, a fighting tour. Now, the images and their ideas behind those images, which were first sent to me, were, um, you could see exactly where they were coming from. You know, they. To, to, to be engaged in that sort of operational deployment, uh, you have to have uh, an enormous sense of right in what you're doing and uh, a collective, um, controlled 
aggression and violence to get the work done and to achieve your mission with the minimum of your own casualties, you know, mm -hmm. that is a, that is just a military thing. Um, and so these f their first ideas and some images they sent to me were appropriate to them and very much in tune with the mentality that they had to have collectively uh, at that time when they, were, when they were engaged in an operational deployment. However, um, completely inappropriate for a high street back in the home country. This comes down to, you know, it's, it's body language. This is what we use um, mm -hmm. as sculptors in facial expression when, when doing the human subject. So what was, what was their input that wouldn't be uh, it, You know, it was, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was an uh, almost a caricature of a um, aggressive, um, dynamic pose. You know, so it's you know it's very much it was almost like a sort of John Wayne stance, you know, weapon up on the shoulder, leaning forward, you know, into the fight, um, a dramatic image, um, uh, which tied in with how they had to feel about themselves then, and this is what they were doing. It would have been a a body posture that was seen daily, but it had a certain uh, sort of inappropriateness when it came to actually. Remembering the dead, which was the main purpose, and actually, you know, having something which would engage passers-by, or as I said, right. maybe even leadership, okay, yeah, uh, so as I part of our, our, the fabric of our sort of public spaces. And so it actually took quite a few months in the first instance, through dialogue and, and through a series of very quick thumb sketches, to just tailor their first ideas into something which actually incorporated more about the nobility of sacrifice and acquire strength and courage um, which are the more timeless and more um, um, memorable in my mind sort of qualities but you know it, it, what is in, it was interesting so that psychological aspect of it um, and by time I said these series of sketches when they'd come back from tour and they were themselves winding down from that heightened state over a couple of months and it was during this time that we had these conversations and oh, settled okay. into something and it, you know, it does come down to um, um, to body posture, and even I mean, it's called within the, within the military. There is a phrase, weapons posture, um, which is about you know the the sort of presentation and projection when when you when you're in uh, an area interacting with a population, you know, you either consciously keep your weapon down, um, or you have it in a more um, uh, you know, immediately usable position, yeah. you know, in the shoulder, um, you know, if you want to look at something, you're looking down the sights, but also if you're looking down the sights just to get a good view of something, that's where your barrel's pointing. Right. You exactly. know, and, and actually, depend, and depending on the threat level and the, what you want to project and your intentions, um, um, and I like to think I went as far as I could to introduce some um, grace and elegance into what is essentially a, a, a young man standing up, dripping in military equipment. You know, and that's the other thing. You have to, yes, you have to, you have to honour the the the, um, um, the foundation of, of 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 a commission like that, which is which is a memorial. Um, but uh, you know, you talk about context. It was in a you know a, a quiet, gentle, beautiful place, you know, slightly tucked, tucked off Windsor High Street. You know, it's it's set amongst some um, some some mature trees um, and footfall of. Of our foreign visitors passing through, I mean, again, you don't you don't want a British soldier in a very aggressive pose. Now, when, when you you used an actual soldier as the model for your uh, for your statue, is that correct? Yes, for the Irish, for I mean, the Irish a Irish handful, Irish. one main one, and then I was describing people as I needed them. Really, really? well, like when you saw a guy walking by that had the right kit on, sort of thing, or I just sometimes anyone who was free, sometimes you just needed literally a sort of uh, a human mannequin, and um, but. It, Rather than using one one person, you know, they 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 um, uh, made one person in particular more available, um, um, which which was fantastic because uh, you know, obviously they were having to do their daily work uh, um, as as a group. But actually, uh, having having using a few different ones tied in very much with the fact that I didn't want it to be a recognisable portrait. It was very much an idealised version of a young guardsman. Um, and so I didn't want anything too specific to, to, to sort of to, to creep in, if anything, you know, using 
a selection of different models um, actually encourages you to be more generic. What sort of feedback have you gotten from the, the Irish Guard since it's been uh, uh, unveiled, since it's been mounted? Well, the funny thing about feedback is, unless you come across something online or in the press or whatever, but personal feedback is rarely negative. I, I, I think they, they, were, they, they, were, they were happy with, mm -hmm. with the work in the end. Right. Um, well, I also know that you have done... Collectively. Yeah. yeah but, but also, but, I mean, in terms of... I mean, I had some very moving personal messages as you do when you do these sort of mm -hmm. works from people who are directly affected and for whom it means the most. So, you know, the mothers of young soldiers who have died. Um, um, and actually on that tour, they lost uh, three soldiers on that tour. And in order to make it um, more of a, a shrine for those very intimate group of people who were there at the unveiling, who actually lost family members before the final weld was done on the pieces which had been cast you know, um, separately. We, we put in just a handful of personal effects of the soldiers that actually died. So okay. there's a set of dog tags in there, there's a set of rank slides. When you, when you say inside... Manchester, you, Manchester United mug. You're talking about actually inside, inside the box. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's almost like a time capsule then. Yeah, yeah. And Excellent. it's actually things you know, taken from, from those individuals' personal effects. That is fantastic. Yeah. If you go to the podcast website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and click on the image gallery link for this episode, you can find there the Irish Guardsman Memorial, sculpted by Mark Jackson, as well as several other of his works. But as Jackson himself says, his career cannot be defined solely by his military work. And we'll hear more about how Jackson's life has given him particular insight, which has served him well in other areas of commemorative work, when the sculptor's funeral continues. <laughs> Hi everyone, I just wanted to give you an update on some workshops I'll be teaching this summer in England. There are still several places open for the Wiltshire Workshop, the two-week marble carving course taking place outside of Marlborough this August from the 10th to the 22nd. You can sign up and find all the information you need at the podcast website, thesculpturesfuneral.com. Just click on the Wiltshire Workshop button at the top of the homepage. Also, I'm going to be teaching two other workshops in Devon in September. Mapstone Studio in Lustley is hosting me for two weeks. Now, the first week is going to be a five-day écorché anatomy course. An écorché, of course, is the term used for flayed figure, an anatomical model without its skin, revealing the structure of the muscles and the bones inside. Now, can an écorché be sculpted in just five days? Yes, yes, it can. Each student will be modeling every muscle and tendon useful for the visual artist directly onto a small-scale resin skeleton. So there's no need to spend weeks modeling tiny little clay bones that you'll never see on the live model anyway. We're going to be doing the muscles of the face separately on a life-size plaster skull, and both the skull and the écorché figure are yours to keep. Then, in the following week at Mapstone Studios, I'll be leading an intensive six-day course on modeling the human figure from life in clay. Using a live model, we'll produce a seated figure pose about 40% life size, using the sight size technique of modeling. And we'll also learn how to build up a figure without an armature. And then the works will be hollowed out at the end of the course, and then fired into terracotta statuettes. Now the écorché course runs from the 31st of August to the 4th of September, and the figure workshop runs the next week, September 7th through the 12th. All the information can be found at the Mapstone Studio website, mapstonestudio.com, all one word. That's mapstonestudio.com for September workshops in anatomy and figure modeling. So I'll see you all in Devon. Now in, when was it? In, uh, I think, uh, 2012, 2011, 2012, uh, you were approached for the memorial for the man who founded the Paralympics. Is that correct? Yeah, he was a fascinating character, and in my ignorance, I hadn't heard of him. And that was one of the main motivations behind uh, a group of people coming together to organise, to raise funds for, and organise uh, a memorial to him, to raise public consciousness of someone who should definitely be in our lexicon of you know, cultural, uh, known people. Uh, well, great, he, tell me about him. What, what he's, an, he's an incredible person. Well, I had to learn very quickly. Um, Ludwig Gutmann was um, 
he hailed, he was a Jew, and he hailed from uh, Upper Silesia, which is now uh, in the borders of Poland. And as a young surgeon uh, in his early 20s, he attended a mining collapse, and he was particularly struck by the appalling injuries and subsequent quick, relatively quick death of a, of a young miner who had been paralyzed, who had had his spinal cord severed. Um, and at the time, a spinal injury, a, a paralysis, would give you uh, an average life expectancy of three or four months. Are you kidding? No. Wow, now, just, just from... Pro- I mean, <laughs> this was in the 30s. Now, in the, in the, oh, late, okay. in the late 30s, um, I mean, Goodman already had a... Um, um, a lecturing position in a teaching hospital as well as his own practice. He was doing a lot of research, groundbreaking research, into spinal injuries. But with the Nazification of um, the late mid late thirties, um, he lost his uh, his, pub- his public chair in the in university. Um, he and his family uh, remained there through Crystal Act, uh, when the writing was really on the wall, uh, really at the last minute, with help from his uh, professional colleagues in the in the English medical community. He managed to get his, his family on a boat, and they arrived in Dover in, in 1939. Um, and he was forever incredibly grateful to that, you know, that, that country which gave him and his family refuge. All his wife's family subsequently died in the camps. Um, now, at the time, because we, had, uh, we were at war, declared war with Germany, medics were not allowed to practice medicine if they were of German origin. Oh, really? Was just a blanket ban on it. So, actually, he was almost first of all to go to Oxford, continued his, his research into spinal injuries. Um, and then actually, a year or two later, uh, they, in his example, he, they lifted the ban and they asked him to go to Stetso Manville and set up a spinal injuries uh, ward and put some of his research and his findings into practice. And he did things which are now um, taken for granted amongst the, the treatment of spinal injuries, but mitigating against what really kills which is uh, infections, either internal organs or, or bed, bed sores. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I mean, one of the things he did, he, he, he got the, uh, you know, the sort of carpenter, the, the, the caretaker, um, to build him a, a, a wooden box, a sauna essentially, in his, in his office. Um, and he would put uh, paralyzed people in there. And he, worked, uh, he had discovered that um, we only sweat where the nerves are active. So actually, oh. if you can, if you can uh, make a sweat map of the surface of the body, you can um, be quite accurate on a superficial level about where nerves are still alive and where they are, where they are dead. Interesting. Um, this was the sort of thing he was doing. Um, he was a tiny, you know, he was five foot three, if that, um, little battleship. Um, I think very, a very uh, um, uh, difficult, sort of brash man, very energetic, uh, but, but with a, a huge heart. And his, um, his great cry was to turn spinal injuries back into taxpayers, which, which sounds a bit extraordinary, but actually it was his way of saying, you know, they can have life in the first instance, they can have quality of life, they can have family life, they can have a working life. Whereas before they, as I said, they, you know, they, had, they had months to live. Now, at that time in England, uh, coming back from the battlefields were a lot of spinal injuries from World War II. Uh, so a lot of up to very recently, you know, very, very fit, uh, young people were coming to him. He incorporated activity. He was the first one to use any physio or spinal injuries, and those who did have some form of ability, he encouraged to get up and get active and, and started uh, playing sports. They so played a version of sort of, uh, uh, sort of wheelchair hockey, um, archery, anything which, anything which, which, which they could do if, if they could, depending on their, um, basically their sea level of, of paralysis. As part of this, you know, for really for that's always for fun more than anything else. They held the Stoke Mandible Games uh, uh, a couple of years after the war. Um, um, you know, I think a group of uh, paralysed uh, patients, athletes from Holland, I think it was, came over, and there was the first international games, oh. and that transpired and became the Paralympics. Um, and Goodman himself, I mean, continued running the spinal injuries unit here at, at Stoke Mandible, which was a world leader. Know, for, for decades, but even when he sort of stepped away, retired from that, he, he continued in a sort of supervisory role at the Paralympics. Um, and so the Paralympics was always seen as a kind of tier two event, even dare I say it, it was a source of some kind of sort of, if not mockery, it wasn't particularly taken seriously. The athletes weren't taken seriously as athletes, yeah. it was crazy. 
and it was more of a spectacle. Um, and it just so coincided, I think, that the time had had come for Paralympic athletes to be seen for what they really are as, as you know, in many ways almost sort of superhuman compared to their disabilities, you know. And, and it came home with, with, with our last games, summer games here in London. The first time the Paralympics has stood, even in terms of viewing figures and popularity, uh, superseded the actual normal Olympics. Uh, so the, the Gutman statue was commissioned to celebrate him, to tie in with having to, uh, to raise funds to continue good work in his name um, in the area of the arts. So whereas he had certainly dedicated a large part of his life to the use of sport and activity in the treatment of, of spine injuries, um, and, and his, certainly his ethos and his achievements can be seen outside the spinal injuries world, you know, so talking about amputees or um, people born, born with, uh, with um, um, physical challenges. And there was a group of essentially people who were, uh, his, his, had worked with him or had even been patients of him, um, who brought the group together and they wanted to set up a charity and raise money to fund the use of arts and rehabilitation in the way that he had done with sport. So that ties in quite nicely. And it was an incredible experience for me. So, you know, I, for example, you know, I, I, um, one of the commissioners has become a firm friend, uh, Mike McKenzie, an incredible man, um, who had actually uh, lost a leg and been paralysed in a road accident in Bosnia, uh, working for a, for, a, for a charity himself. Subsequent, subsequently lost, lost the other leg um, for, um, with complications. And... Uh, you know, uh, a year after I think we completed a statue, I, I ushered at his wedding. So to be to be um, welcomed in uh, and and so informed about that subculture, which you might not necessarily sort of brush up against, right? Um, was fantastic. You know, on a really sort of human level. Well, let me ask you. I mean, uh, okay, with your background in the military, your your accident, uh, and the arts, uh, were you were you approached for this, or is this something that you applied for? Because frankly, you seem like the perfect person to do this memorial. Well, um, that's very kind of you to say so. And, well, I mean, and, and, I mean um, and how many other them, people have and your the, and, and we'll put it, the commissioners were of the same thought. So actually, that one came about um, uh, on the back of a small article that happened to be in the national press following an exhibition I held soon after coming back from Florence. And they're just um, read the article and got hold of me because they, right. they thought the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I can't think of anyone, military, art, uh, injury. You're, you're, you know, you kind of fit the bill. Yeah, as, um, <laughs> as my uh, uh, paralyzed, very good friend dismissively um, says, I, I'm a near miss, as in you're not in the game. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the Goodman Memorial? Um, it stands at the entrance to um, State Medical Hospital, which is the uh, National Spinal Injury Centre. Where's uh, that located? Stoke Mandeville is a, is a... Oh, that's the name of the town. I'm sorry. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's the name of the town. Stoke Mandeville? Stoke Mandeville. So okay. Buckinghamshire. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there's also a separate bus that we... Well, uh, there are busts. Um, the, the Goodman Trust, who commissioned the statue, they have a bus. Um, Wheel Power, which is a charity which runs the Paralympic uh, training stadium at Stoke, Stoke Mandeville, um, they have a bust. But there's a bronze bust which um, was um, funded by a sponsor um, and now belongs to the Inter International Paralympic Committee, so it's with them in Bonn. And the, um, the hope is that you know, he, that bust will travel to every Paralympic um, Games. In the oh, future. fantastic. Yeah. Oh, neat. So what are you working on now, these days? Um, right now. Well, um, I know, right you now see, you're doing a portrait of James a Hayes. A portrait of James Hayes. He's so your second a shot, right? Distinctly average painter. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but in terms of the, my my last um, statue, was actually my first corporate commission for a, uh, a philanthropic finance house based in Dubai. Philanthropic finance house. Yes, that's what I thought. They're quite an interesting corporation headed up by uh, a very um, kind of incredible person in his own right who has uh, a large amount of personal wealth. Um, they don't have any private clients. Uh, they just um, use his money to, to increase their pot and they spend it on some 
very large scale philanthropic projects around the world, oh, especially wow. in the continents of the uh, well, subcontinent of India and, uh, and the African continent. It, it on a on a um, academic level, it raises quite an interesting sort of line of debate. I mean, they are obviously using the open markets, and I had a very interesting chat with their their head of trading, who's a very sophisticated Parisian who had um, worked for big national banks around the world and, and hedge funds. Um, who, who, when I asked him, was very clear that they didn't impose any um, restrictions on themselves in terms of ethics, apart from what was legally acceptable in international trading. So they're playing the open markets, um, uh, creating basically financially the ability to help large numbers of people. Well, that's fine. It's, so it's like a hedge fund or a mutual fund that uh, that then, instead of going to shareholders, goes to charitable organiza- organizations. Correct. Yeah. Um, it's been a uh, it was a really challenging commission actually because uh, their logo happened to be um, a generic classical, we settled on Greek roughly, um, archer uh, a sporting archer, they didn't, actually didn't use archery so much for um, as a military weapon, as sport and hunting, uh, it was fantastic having you know, the British Museum literally on my, on, on my doorstep as it were for reference material I very much sort of pushed it anatom- anatomically, I hadn't really sort of really Pushed anatomy on a life size scale like that before, so yeah. I, when you, I, when you I, say when you say push anatomy, sort of like go for a sort of an idealized musculature. I mean, I've worked very right? closely with uh, a model. Um, I mean, you don't need a working on a life size piece. As you know, you don't need a model there all the time. You can spend the morning working on a foot. You can just take your sock off. You know, or, yeah. You know, or get the knee out. Or yeah. You know. um, but yeah, you know, I did work closely with a model. But uh, yeah, I did. I did adjust proportions, not in a particularly academic way, really more in a sort of visual, personal judgment way. Um, I mean, if, you know, if, if anything, it's my summation so far of male beauty would be that figure that I, that I did. Well, one of my friends, a painter, who's, yeah. um, who's uh, a very, a very uh, fun, fun uh, colourful character, um, actually his, his, his canon is the wine bottle, and he says, you know, from... Uh, wine bottle? Yeah, from... You know, uh, you know, from in terms of the proportion of, of, of what is above the collarbone to that is what is below is the same as the neck of a white bottle. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, well. huh. But uh, Bordeaux or yeah, white, yeah, yeah. that's a uh, Riesling. Uh. But uh, no, but uh, so, so yeah, so Poly- uh, um, yeah, Polyclitus had a seven head high cannon, but his, uh, and he was famous for it, he still is famous for developing the cannon, yeah. but his own student, Lysippus, came up with one that is eight heads high. And everywhere you go, every every uh, Greek sculptor apparently basically developed their own canon based on their own uh, sort of okay. fairly personal definition. Yeah, it wasn't, is, wasn't so much of a, as a template as we might initially. No, that was think. an idea that became fashionable in the 17th or 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, that there is sort of the secret canon, and you know, if we yeah. can only discover the lost canon of Polyclitus. Of course, he was famous because he, he actually wrote a treatise. He wrote a canon. Okay. And, and that's but that's and, and we have that. We have no, that. no, no, that's the thing. We so we only have work. the examples in his work. We have the examples of his work, and we have uh, testimony, I think, from probably Pliny the Elder or somebody that uh, uh, that he wrote <laughs> exactly <laughs> his sort of secret formula to the perfect human. Yeah. But the thing is, that was his secret formula. It wasn't all for all Greek okay. sculpture. It was really yeah. as personal as uh, as what you know what you yourself did for that. Work. Yeah. That's really cool. Did you actually? I mean, did you did you write it down? Was it a conscious thing, or was it more of an intuitive thing? As you no, might be like, this more looks more visual and intuitive. Yeah, and what looks just, right and what doesn't yeah. look right. Right. Oh, very cool. Um, Are you managing to get any work done? Yeah, yeah, no, I really am. <laughs> You've got a really fluffy beard. At that point, I let Jacko carry on with his portrait bust of James Hayes. When I recorded this interview in London in April, I thought I came away with a pretty good interview about the sculpture of Mark Jackson. But in editing the interview this week, I realized that 90% of the time, Jacko doesn't talk about his sculpture, per se, but rather who the work was for and what these sculptures mean to those who commissioned the work and what it means to those who will see and be impacted by the work. And I think Mark Jackson is very notable in this respect. So many of us end up working for clients who often do not interest us in a personal way. Any sculptor whose main market is the art gallery lacks that personal connection almost entirely. But so far, Jacko has been very fortunate to have had his career in sculpture mesh with his personal interests and experiences, what he regards as worth commemorating, 
allowing him to truly put his talents as a sculptor at the service of who he is as a person. The phrase self-expression and the question of what that entails gets tossed around quite a bit by artists, but I think Mark Jackson's example might be held up as one way of doing it right. Well, I want to thank you all for listening, and don't forget you can check out the work of Mark Jackson, including the statue of Ludwig Gutmann and the Irish Guardsman and more at our website, thesculpturesfuneral.com. Please feel free to drop by our Facebook group page, The Sculptor's Funeral, and post a comment or a question, and join in the conversation with other sculptors from around the world. Have a good week, everyone, and I'll be back next week with more.